The Panasonic Lumix G9 is a one-of-a-kind camera. For people outside Micro Four Thirds system, it might be a camera model that's overshadowed by its sister camera, the legendary GH5, for good reasons. But for Micro Four Thirds shooters, we all know that the original G9 is definitely an icon. Today, we are taking a look at this 20 megapixel Micro Four Thirds Panasonic flagship camera from 2017. After seven years, first let's take a look at the build. It is a large camera for Micro Four Thirds, weighs 658 grams, pretty heavy. Its build quality is tough and premium. Offers a substantial grip, comfortable for long shooting sessions, especially with heavier lenses. The top plate LCD screen is a unicorn design in Micro Four Thirds world. Sadly, the G9 Mark II did not continue with the original G9's design, but chose to go with its full-frame S5 series body design, which means the removal of the top plate screen. Many people, including myself, lamented this decision. It took away one of the most striking features that made G9 so unique. Yes, you can see the key shooting information at a glance down at the camera without having to look through the viewfinder or a back screen. A small feature but really matters a lot for many people. The on-off button is another unique design in all Micro Four Thirds lineup. It situates around the shutter button where your index finger naturally rests upon. Ergonomically, it makes a lot of sense because you can sling the camera in one hand and turn it on with a twitch of finger, then you are ready to shoot. The on and off switch also doubles as a trigger for the top plate LCD screen backlight. Very smart design. The one issue I have with this camera's build is its front dial, which is behind the shutter button as opposed to in front of it like most other cameras. It feels a little bit awkward to use to bend my finger back to try to turn the dial. Plus the rubberized gear makes it too soft to give resistance to a good turn. I find it very uncomfortable to use and, and more often than not, I just use the back dial because I shoot aperture priority and I don't need two dials anyway. If it was in front of the shutter button and lay horizontally instead of vertically, like on the full frame S1 series cameras, then it would have been perfect. The camera features abundant amount of customizable buttons all over the body, front and back, including a toggle switch on the front that can be customized. It's very cool retro design that is found on increasingly more modern cameras. On the left hand side of the camera, there is a mode dial, underneath which is a drive mode dial. Personally, I prefer this stacking design over the two separate dials like on the G9 Mark II. It saves a lot of space to have the top plate LCD screen on the G9. The buttons are more bubbly and feels more responsive to press than, for example, GH5. Dual UHS-2 card slot, old USB mini port that can be used to recharge the battery, top tier OLED viewfinder is ahead of its time, with a maximum magnification of 0.83 times equivalent and a resolution of 3.68 million dots, a treat to the eye, and of course a great articulating screen. Overall, it's a once in a lifetime occurrence in Lumix or even in the whole Micro Four Thirds universe. It resembles the S1 series camera more than the Micro Four Thirds cameras in Lumix lineup. The very singular camera that stands out of the crowd in a very good way. Shame that they killed the design in G9 Mark II. S5 body design surely has won over a lot of fans, but giving up on G9 body? Oof, big mistake by Panasonic. Maybe not financially, because I'm sure it cuts down cost using almost identical body design as S5, but it sure killed something in the hearts of many loyal fans of original G9. Now let's talk about the inside. Burst mode and buffer. It is designed with fast action, sports, and wildlife photography in mind. With an electronic shutter, it shoots up to 20 frames per second with a continuous autofocus, 60 frames per second with a single autofocus. It even comes with a pre-burst mode that is becoming more and more ubiquitous among high-end cameras across different brands, albeit having a very small buffer and short shooting time. 20 frames per second is probably a good number for high-intensity action shoots. In most situations, I much prefer using mechanical shutter in highest burst mode which is 9 frames per second in continuous autofocus. For slow moving animals and sports, it's more than enough. In this mode, it shoots up to about 60 pictures in one single burst. Not a big buffer by any means, but I never hold down burst for that long in one go anyway. 
It's always short burst and then wait a little bit and then short burst again. Eventually you do hit the limit of the buffer. When shooting in 20 frames per second, the buffer fills up in just about 3 seconds. 50 pictures burst in one go. Relatively limited compared to its successor, the G9 Mark II, which can get up to 200 pictures at a time in 20 frames per second. Sometimes with a G9, when I burst shoot a lot and try to review the photos right away, the camera might freeze. Don't panic. From the top plate LCD screen, you can see the total number of shots available is going down. Means the camera is working hard, writing the photos into the card. Just take a short while, it will come back online. Overall, the burst is super impressive if you consider its release time of 2017-2018, way ahead of its time and its competitors. Buffer is pretty small, but you can work around it by shooting short bursts and proceeding with more deliberation on when to press the shutter. It also features a computational multi-shot high-resolution mode on tripod, which is the first time this feature appeared in Panasonic camera lineup. It can shoot up to 80 megapixel images, providing much more detail, much better noise performance and dynamic range due to multiple exposure. A powerful landscape or stationary object camera works really well at night for long exposure landscape shots. Photo autofocus. Thanks to the DFD technology, depth from the focus, however much it doesn't make sense, is the pinnacle of contrast detect autofocus, no matter how you look at it. There are many notorious drawbacks, such as focus hunting, flickering, nervousness in autofocus. It doesn't track subject as well as face detect autofocus. But it is indeed very fast and accurate in most scenarios. Single autofocus is no problem at all. You just point and shoot and it's in focus every single time. Lightning fast. So we'll only discuss the AFC, the continuous autofocus here. I tested it over and over at local cat shelter with a great result over 90% hit rate in continuous autofocus, shooting highest burst rate with both mechanical shutter and electronic shutter. I can comfortably track and shoot general movements. Due to contrast-based autofocus, you see the image flickers in and out of focus constantly through the viewfinder when you have pressed the shutter button. But somehow, magically, the end results are almost always in focus, despite the hunting you see in the viewfinder. It doesn't inspire confidence seeing the flickering when you are shooting them, but you have to learn to trust it in most situations. The human and animal detection autofocus mode is amazing. It puts a box around the subject and sticks to it pretty well. I like that it groups both animal and human detection in one setting. On my G9 Mark II, there are two separate detection modes. A bit nuisance to switch it back and forth sometimes. In my test at Cat Shutter, it hits near 100% on still subjects. Also very high hit rate on slow moving subjects. It struggles when the subject get close and occupy a large part of the frame. One of the reasons I think is that the lens itself struggles more in close distance shooting since I was using the Leica 100 to 400. It's not exactly designed for shooting moving subjects merely 2 or 3 meters away. Probably not camera's fault. Another factor is that when the cat takes up 3 quarters of the frame, I think the animal detection algorithm just cannot distinguish what is cat and what is background anymore due to the lack of face or eye detection. When shooting subject in complicated scenes, it can get tricky. Sometimes the camera sticks to the grass despite having the cat in detection box. The solution is to tap on a cat to correct the focus. I expect the camera to prioritize the cat in animal detection mode shooting in continuous autofocus, but unfortunately, it's not that advanced. You have to think in three layers when this issue occurs. Foreground layer, subject layer, and background layer. Identify on which layer the focus is stuck. Have press shutter button to refocus on the correct layer, aka the subject layer where the cat is at. Then it will stick to the cat. If you focus on the grass in front at first, it will likely stick to the grass no matter what. Even if the cat is the most prominent thing in the frame to human eyes, the camera stubbornly doesn't switch over. I was shooting in custom AF setting, set 1, which has minus 1 AF sensitivity plus 1 AF area switching sensitivity. You are free to play with the setting a little bit, like bumping up all the sensitivities to plus 2 maybe. It will be more responsive in fast moving scenes, but it will cause more misfocus in regular slower shots. It's up to you which setting you prefer. Shooting fast moving subjects such as birds in flight is tough. 
First of all, tracking fast flying birds with a big barrel is never an easy task physically. Most of the birds fly through my line of sight within one or two seconds and disappear behind a tree. So the window is really short, which is more challenging for the camera. On continuous autofocus, the camera does automatically adjust to focus whatever is in the frame, but it might take a few seconds. And by the time the camera auto adjusted to the subject, the bird is already gone. So I need to first point and track the bird physically with the lens and then press the shutter button to trigger autofocus readjustment in order to get subject in focus. If I already have pressed the shutter, then raise the lens to track the bird, the camera probably won't find the bird. It just stick to the ground or completely out of focus. I imagine that it's not going to be easy to shoot fast moving birds with any camera. It's never gonna be just point and shoot and every single shot is in perfect focus, except for maybe the top tier action cameras like Sony A9 or A1 series. It's always going to be a lot of work, a lot of anticipation and patience, and a lot of hit and miss. Just keep the hits and discard the misses. I'm happy with how it works out. Of all, great performance, I am indeed highly confident in this camera's autofocus capability in stills shooting. In all practical usage, it doesn't trail too far behind G9 Mark II. Just keep in mind some of the quirks and get used to the control. It should be a very capable camera for action. The dynamic range and low light is well handled thanks to the incredible IBIS. It was rated higher than the GH5. It can easily defeat low light issues with a handheld long exposure shot. I don't think I'm particularly worried about low light with this camera. I did some side by side low light shot comparison against G9 Mark II. There doesn't seem to be any significant difference. The color science is really great straight out of camera. Usually I shoot raw, but when birds shooting animals, I prefer to use JPEG and add sharpness and contrast in camera. So the end results straight out of the camera are just perfect, sharp and vibrant, beautiful color. Now let's talk about the video features. Simply put, it was way ahead of its time, borrowed all the good stuff from GH5, the 4K 60p, the 10-bit 422 up to 4K 30p, and great, great 1080p video quality in 100 megabits per second bitrate, just like GH5. This 1080p video quality blew my mind when I first got it. And he has Cine D, Cine V profile built in and has optional V-Lock light if you purchase the upgrade. Pity that it has only 30 minutes recording limit and 10 minutes for 4K 60p. Otherwise, it would outshine GH5. It does tend to overheat if you try to shoot long videos by hitting the record button again after 30 minutes. Video autofocus, I want to say great, but people would have doubt. Like, how can contrast-based autofocus be great in video? Well, it is fast, accurate, and sticks to the subject really well, and can switch its focus between subjects fairly efficiently. But there's the flickering, unavoidable for any contrast-based cameras, especially with the DFD. They hunt really rapidly, and it's distracting. But if you can overlook this flaw, this camera's autofocus actually performs really well in general situation. The flickering is often found in high contrast areas such as tree branches in the sky in the background when you focus on something in the foreground. So keep that in mind. If you don't want to see flickering, avoid those kind of background. I've done some vlogging style shooting tests and it works perfectly fine, sticks to my face perfectly and never hesitates. However, when shooting a group of people or when people are facing away from the camera, there may be some haunting issue that the camera doesn't recognize where the human is to focus on. These are some clips I shot uh, at a wedding. And as you can see, if you pay attention, there's some hunting here and there. Uh, but overall, it looks really nice. And color looks really nice straight off of, out of the camera. Uh, I don't remember what profile did I shoot in. Either, either it's natural profile or it's Cine D. I, I think I shot in natural profile without too much color grading. And the color straight out of GH5 and G9 are just wonderful, beautiful. Here are some clips I shot in cat shutter with the G9 and like 100 to 400 lens.
eight hundred and four hundred mil. Smooth. The contrast detect autofocus system on G9 in video is not terrible as people think. Like, wow, it won't focus or it jumps in and out of focus all the time. It's not like that at all. It's not as responsive as face detect autofocus, of course. It can be hesitant in complicated scenes under tough lighting conditions, but for the most part, it's totally fine. Going on a hike, casual vlogging, documenting daily life, film your pets, your kids, that kind of stuff. I have no doubt that G9 can produce great results. To sum it up quickly, though I won't use G9 for any critical autofocus tasks like B-roll or paid project, I think the phobia of contrast detect autofocus in video is grossly exaggerated by online review community. Now let's talk about low light performance in video. I tested it against G9 Mark II at ISO 6400 and 12800, both using natural profile at 12mm f2.8. The G9 Mark II resolved a little bit more detail despite having a lot of grain just like G9. Both are great at ISO 6400, especially when shooting well-lit subject at night. And I've done comparison of G9 versus GH5 and Sony A7S II two years ago. Here are my findings. At 1600 ISO, it is pretty clean. And 3200 ISO is decent until you look hard in the shadows. That's where the noise are starting to appear. At ISO 6400, it will be noisy, but totally usable for YouTube. At ISO 12800, it is noisy, but surprisingly holds up well for Micro Four Thirds. There's no crazy color shift, nor did it get so grainy that there's no detail left, like in many older cameras. In my test, I used the f2.8 on the G9 and f4 on a7S II, uh, both at ISO 12800, so the a7S II got a little bit handicap. Uh, yet at ISO 12800, the A7S2 is, is clearly the winner. It is absolutely clean despite the aperture disadvantage, but the G9 is not bad at all. In conclusion, the G9 is pretty capable shooting low light as long as the subject is properly lit. For general purpose, I keep maximum ISO cap at 6400, but in a pinch, you can totally use 12800 without degrading image quality too much. So compare this camera to the G9 Mark II. The G9 has a better build, better handling, better aesthetic style, slightly better viewfinder, and better ergonomics. But the G9 Mark II has all the powerful new tech in a body that is efficiently built, beloved by full frame S5 series users. First face detect autofocusing Lumix Micro Four Thirds lineup. Better sensor and low light, and G9 Mark II is pushed to the maximum for functionality and power. I still have a lot of sample images to show, and uh, we just place them here. Hopefully, I hope you can just sit back and relax and enjoy the pictures. And I'm gonna play them a little bit slower, and after that, we'll go to the conclusion. In summary, G9 is still an amazing camera. It's ahead of its time and still shines today, worth buying used as well as new. It is a flagship on a budget, excels both on photo and video fronts. I believe it will stand the test of time even further into the next 5 years, at least. Probably the most longevity in any camera I observe in mirrorless cameras in terms of technical relevancy. If I have to give it a rating, it's 11 out of 10. Highly, highly recommended to anyone. 
That's it. Thanks for watching and subscribing and see you next time.